I am with Dr. Uh, Mella. Yes, yes. That's correct. Uh, he is the uh, professor of psychiatry at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, so he's a he's kind of a big deal. Uh, and he's been here at the conference, and he's been so nice uh, enough to uh, share uh, some insight to us. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Doctor. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. During the conversation, guys, I am going to do uh, I'm going to do my best to answer. Uh, if you have questions for uh, Doctor Mello, because we are going to uh, talk about a certain uh, conversation, a certain topic, and that uh, is medication. But we're going to get there. Uh, so thanks for joining us. You're uh, so, uh, Doctor Mello, what? Uh, how did you get involved in FASD? How did that come around? So my first contact actually was working in a correctional facility that is used to treat offenders mm -hmm. and doing the same thing over and over and over without understanding why I wasn't making a lot of success. Right. Ran into a psychologist who said to me, have you ever considered the abnormalities of the brain caused by FASD in some of your patients you're getting frustrated about? And then I took an interest to read a little bit about it and could see the pattern of some of the forgetfulness that I was seeing, the inability to remember things, and then got involved and it's been a good journey so far. Right. So you're, you're involved in diagnosis? Yes. Right? Uh, and you're also uh, in medication that that's we talked correct. about, and I think yeah. that's, uh, um, I, I get questions about it. I am not a doctor, mm -hmm. so I usually, uh, this is what I say, and you tell me if I'm wrong. So when people talk to me about medication, uh, first I give the disclaimer that I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. and then I say, well, I have two, I have two, seri uh, two frames of th thought here. Uh, one is that you know I heard from uh, Diane Melvin before. Would you give someone medication just because they were blind? Right. right? I hear that yeah. end of it. And then I also know from experience as being a foster parent uh, that uh, that some of the kids I've worked with and raised could not function without medication, right? right? right. And so, um, very briefly, what are your thoughts? Because I find some kids are over-medicated, under-medicated. So when you have a, a, a parent who isn't sure, how, how should they approach the medication aspect first? How old should they be? Like, when should they be introducing this? Mm -hmm. And when is it possibly just dismaturity, yeah. right? And so they just act chronologically younger uh, the, well, they act younger than their chronological age. So when should parents be thinking about that? What okay. type of medication? I'm just going to let you go. Ahead. Thanks, Jeff, for sharing actually the spectrum or the polls about medication when it comes to FASD. And those polls should be respected because they're genuinely presented in the context of why do you give medication when you don't know what you're giving? There's no evidence that you can rely on or why would you not give medication when you can see very obvious response mm -hmm. that helps people to function? So what I have done, as I mentioned in my experience, was the recognition that I was having patients in both camps, some people who will react very badly with tiny doses of medication, others that cannot function without medication. And so in my diagnostic role, in my clinical uh, care role, I've had to take a more active, research-based approach to this. And so what we have done, and I think for the audience to be aware, is that right now there is no medication that is indicated for the disorder called FASD. So every medication that is prescribed for someone with FASD is based out of off-label prescription. So there were no studies that were done to approve it through the granting agencies like Health Canada or the FDA. Okay. However, some literature has helped us to know that people actually benefit. Now, who benefits and who doesn't is still the big uh, question that we have to answer. So what we have done recently in a group uh, exercise brought on by Can FSD, where I'm the lead, is to bring a couple of experts that we know are doing this prescribing so that they can share their experience in conjunction with what has been written in the literature. So we've completed what we call the evidence behind what we prescribe, a systematic review. We found about 25 journal articles that talk about the role of medications in those with FASD. We've synthesized them, we've come up with some idea of what can be tried and put that in the framework of a principle 
And some of these principles are actually more important than the medication. And I think this is the message we want to go out to people, that there is a principle behind giving medication. For example, first and foremost, you need to know that there is a diagnostic conundrum you're dealing with. It's just not a single, simple case it's in front of you. It's not just FASD. Exactly. There are many things right? that happen with them. Right. Exactly. Secondly is that you need to understand that the response of medications in those with FASD is different from those without FASD. So you have to be cautious about that and you have to know what to expect. Thirdly is that when you use medications, it should be based on the fact that you have already provided the behavioral support, the uh, social support that the person needs, or else you're just going to be actually causing more harm because the medication sometimes may not be needed. Because if you provide those right. things. Right. Um, I, I heard from someone, I don't know if it was Donald DeBolt or Diane Melvin, but medication is never response, a good response for a poor environment. No, absolutely not. We understand there are some pressures. As a teacher, I come to you and say, I don't want this boy to leave my class. I need him to just sit. Right, right. Even if you don't provide the uh, support, there's sometimes that physicians get pressured to prescribe something. And we are saying we need to try and take caution in ensuring that people get those supports. The other thing that people are, have to actually realize, uh, Jeff, is that when you give medication, you have to see it as one of the supports, mm -hmm. not as the medication, right. as one of the supports. And if you think of a support, support sometimes can not be needed, partially needed, mostly needed, or all the time needed. So you have to think about medicines that way. And you start low, you go slowly, you observe the context, you provide someone to ensure that the medication is being taken. I mentioned earlier, and I'm stressing, the principles I'm talking about are more important than the medicine itself. Because without those principles, the medicine would not work and will cause more harm. And, and the principle being uh, making sure that the environmental supports are in place first. Absolutely. Before you even consider Exactly. That's right? very important. Now, yeah. when, um, so let's say these uh, uh, these environmental supports are in place, uh, when should they approach a doctor uh, about medication? And I'm concerned that if a, they go to a doctor who isn't uh, educated on FASD, yeah. the wrong prescription uh, might be given. What kind of, how can we empower the caregiver yeah. uh, to take control of that? Because I know a, a lot of times caregivers know in their gut yeah. right that if it's if it's working or not working but you know a lot of times they will say well you were the professional so you know what you're doing and I'm just gonna give my kid you know uh, what, what you tell me yeah. uh, to give so how do we empower caregivers yeah. to go to a doctor and say well I don't know if this is working or yeah. does that make sense very much so as I'm speaking I'm sure caregivers are hearing about these principles and sometimes even in consultation with your child with your adolescent with your youth with your adult yourself, it's worthwhile mentioning to the doctor that, look, are you aware of these principles? Can I get you literature about it? Or do you want to read about it? That's one. Now, we do understand that what I'm saying right now has not yet been synthesized articulately in a literature form. And we are working with these experts to try within, we are hoping in the next six months to have something that can be placed in the hands of family uh, doctors, awesome. with uh, physicians, with parents. One of the things that is interesting with the FASD work is that we don't work in isolation. We hear, like in this group of experts, we actually have a parent with us telling us how do we disseminate this. So we hope in the next six months we should have a document that someone can say, have you looked at this? Is this something that you're practicing so that my, pa my child is not harmed and that you're actually doing what is recommended? Now, one of the things that we also have to understand is that there is not a lot of evidence that we have yet. Right. So whatever we get back from parents, audience, as you're hearing, we need to hear from you that we tried this. We call it an algorithm. So you go step one, step two, step three. We tried this. We like this. We did like that. We need that back so that we can go back again and use it now to prepare a better document maybe in about three to four years time. So can parents access this algorithm? 
Well, as of now, we don't have it ready. As okay. I said, we've got the literature done, we've got the experts talking, and now we're trying to put it together in within form that can be next, dis in the next, next six, six months. months. Yes. If yeah. you have a question for Dr. Uh, uh, Mella, you can let me know. I'm going to totally see if I can read some here. Uh, what do you want to know about medication? Very good question. Um, I can tell you what we found in the literature that rhymes with what the experts are saying. And what they're saying is that when an individual is sitting in front of you with FASD, the medications to use will depend on what is the most impairing presentation. And we have at least four different things that we know can impair the presentation of an individual. Somebody who is emotionally aroused, somebody who is emotionally dysregulated, somebody who is cognitively impaired, impulsivity, executive functioning, and those things respond to different medications. So, so far, what it may look like is first, if there is impairment from this hyper arousal, there are certain medications, for example, mood stabilizers and anti-anxiety medications that can reduce the arousal. And there is evidence that those have been used with good success, and most of the experts suggested some of them that are used. If you have hyperactivity and impulsivity in the neurocognitive component, some stimulants given in low doses, preferably on a longer acting rather than shorter acting, if given with caution and monitored all the body uh, the ECG. <laughs> so if you can do those testings, then the stimulants can be prescribed safely for those individuals. In certain situations, you may find somebody who has a social uh, deficit, inability to read cues and uh, kind of perceptual problems, and we found a number of the atypical uh, medications that block dopamine to be effective. So these are the kind of uh, directions that we're going, and as I said, these are based on what has been reported in the literature and what the experts are telling us are working. Now, if we get your feedback after those have been tried, we should be able to refine this better for most people. How old, you know, is there a, in a principal terms, is there an age where yeah. uh, no way, or does it depend on, the s on where they fall on the spectrum? Uh, yeah. You know, how the deficits are. So what the literature tells us is that before the age of seven, it is not ideal to use the powerful psychotropic medications. When I say powerful, I'm referring to things like stimulants, antipsychotics, that it is not advisable. However, we also know that there are certain situations that the child, though of a young age, has been given something close to powerful. So if you think about anti-epileptic medications, even without FASD, there are kids who are one year old, three year old, that are treated with powerful anti-epileptic medications like valproate, like lamotrigine, like topiramate. Those are powerful medications, but we use them safely in people who are younger. So we really advise as much as possible to stay away from using medication before the age of seven, but recognize that you cannot see someone that will benefit, and you're saying you're just following that. So this would be a strong advice for people to say, put in the support, ensure that this medication is provided safely. So age is a big uh, debate among us as well, but we just want to use age seven as a general guide, knowing that there will be a case-by-case -case basis below that age. Right. Yeah. Now, um, Dr. Anna, who's coming up uh, shortly, I'm going to get into sleep with her. Right. But is there, an, um, because it's obviously troublesome for caregivers. True. You know, the, a lot of the, am I right, because uh, I've, I've heard this about a study where, so our cortisol levels are naturally higher in the morning to get us out of bed. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. And then our cortisol levels lower so at nighttime so we can go to sleep. Yeah. And I heard that there was a study where they found in FASD kids that was the opposite. I haven't seen that study. One of the things about sleep, and I know what I was talking about, the four different things I talked about, emotional and hyperarousal. I didn't mention sleep because there are other things. But sleep is such a significant disruptor of people who have FASD. If you don't sleep, you have a terrible day. You have a terrible right. day, you don't sleep. So both the affected child and the 
family is in crisis. So usually that's where medications are bumped up and bumped up and bumped up. I just finished a conference where iron was being talked about and there are animal studies that show that prenatal alcohol exposure decreases your iron, affects your sleep and gives you restless sleep. So sometimes some of that correction of iron is part of it. So far from what the literature is saying and from what the experts are saying, what we do believe is that there is a need to use the sensory process reprocessing and looking at occupational therapy roles mm. in sleep. That will be number one. Once that has been done and the sleep continues to be a problem, it will be good to exclude some of the causes I'm talking about, lack of iron, hyperarousal from uh, cortisol level, and see if that can be corrected. If those are not corrected, we advise a safe protocol starting with melatonin, where some people probably about 50 to 60 percent will respond to. Yeah. Then moving on to at least there are two medications. They are powerful, no doubt, but they are the ones that are quite specific for the deficit that exists in FASD. They are called trazodone and mirtazapine. Now these are mainly used for anxiety and depression, but they are the ones that actually block the specific receptors that are missing in people with FASD. There are many others, but right, these right. three are the main ones, melatonin, trazodone, and remeron or metazepine. Is there a place, I know you're, you're developing uh, these strategies in yeah. the literature, um, where is a good place for a parent to start? Like, so they're on the medication journey, they're, they're younger, in yeah. the, like, right, toddlers yeah. maybe, uh, where should they, is there a, besides just relying on what their doctor says? I know, I feel bad about this because we started it late and I don't, I'm not aware of a site that you can go and get a lot of information about this particular role of medication. As I said, mm -hmm. there is a systematic review for those who would like to look at that. What was so helpful for us was to have a parent in that room saying, you guys, you cannot waste time. You need to get this out quickly. And one of our dissemination is to make sure that caregivers and parents will get it. So I'm sorry I don't have a specific recommendation apart from scanning the literature. Right. Now, through Can FASD, we have a forum that is going to be going between the experts. Now, if I got a phone call from someone saying, you know, what advice do you have? I can provide this to them. Okay. Or we may be able to get the documents we're looking at for those who are interested. There's a lot of material, but we can be able to provide that. When yeah. the algorithm is ready, we're going to have an easy to understand, easy to follow uh, format that families and parents can have. So there is work being done. I know yeah. you, you would, well, we would love to sit up here and say, go here, do this. Yeah. Uh, but this is what CAN FASD is doing. This That's is what right. Dr. Mello is doing. This is, uh, we are, they're, they're doing this work um, in, in the medication because I think, uh, again, some need it, some don't. We have to be very careful because this That's is a, right. a, a long-term thing. Yeah. And you're saying more about make sure the environmental uh, so supports important. are in place. Very right? crucial, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. awesome. And now you s you said to get a hold of you if you have questions, but we have thousands of people on our our thing, so I don't know. Yeah. Is it maybe uh, if I got them to email me, and right. I could put together uh, uh, an email for you? If there's, sp are you open to I'll, that? I'm more than open to that. To be Did honest, you see that? we are that feeling that? Okay. so bad that you know, apart from the fact that FASD is a little bit of young field, yeah. medication FASD is much, much younger. I mean, like there were some studies that were done in the 90s through 2000 and nothing else after that. So we are far behind. We need to catch up. We know that many diagnosed and undiagnosed are being given medication. We want to streamline it so that the medication is rational and is also effective and not harmful. Awesome. Yeah. If you have a question about medication, you can email me at uh, jeff at fasdforever.com. I'm gonna even put it in the, the comments here. Uh, and then I could put that all together and I can ask, we can get, make sure Dr. Mel, because then awesome. you, you would have a, uh, millions of uh, emails so uh, I don't want you to no, do that but I'll get them together and then, and then maybe we can even up. do a follow-up you know a conference call up. all that stuff I, yeah. I, 
I can't tell you how awesome it is that you are open to this. Uh, yeah. The honesty is excellent. Yeah. Uh, so there's, you know, I, I just like being real and this is what we're working on. And yeah. We're not quite there yet. Yeah. Uh, but next year, uh, if we're sitting down at this conference, hopefully we we'll should be. There should be no reason why we shouldn't be. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> thank much. Thank you, Jeff. I really good luck to everybody. Thank yeah, you thank you. Much. Yeah, thanks for